Hello and welcome to Press TV's The Bait. I'm Marcia Hashimi. It is an inhumane attempt to suffocate Syrians, just like George Floyd and others were cruelly suffocated in the United States and just like Israel suffocates Palestinians on a daily basis. This statement was made by Syria's Foreign Minister Walid al to the United Nations General Assembly. He was criticizing Washington for its crippling sanctions on the country and at the same time prohibiting foreign companies from doing business with Damascus. When will the United States stop trying to destabilize Syria? We'll be looking at this and other questions on this debate. I'd like to welcome my guest to the program, Sarah Flanders from the International Action Center out of New York, and Frederick Peterson, Senior Congressional Defense Advisor out of Washington, D.C. Thank you both for being with us. Well, let's start it off with uh, Sarah in New York. A Syrian Foreign Minister compared what Washington is doing to Syria to the suffocation of Joy, George Floyd and other oppressed people in the United States. Your take on this analogy? Well, this is a pretty exact, accurate analogy. Uh, and that is, it really is an attempt to suffocate Syria. And it is calculated, it's planned, as was the murder of George Floyd and the righteous anger that, that exploded across the United States is the same kind of global response that is needed to the continuing U.S. efforts to suffocate countries through sanctions, through economic sanctions that are intended to destabilize and deprive the most basic goods to the whole population. And they're also really aimed at any cooperation and collaboration among countries of the region, which need trade with each other and exchange. So the efforts to shut this down in regions all over the world, and particularly now intended against Syria, that any, any company, any individual, any corporation anywhere in the world who does even humanitarian assistance to Syria will now be sanctioned by the U.S. That's pretty outrageous, criminal, uh, illegal by every uh, standard of international law and should be, must be condemned. A uh, very important statement that the foreign minister made. He also called for cooperation. That's the only response to this kind of warfare. Hmm. Frederick, your take on this, why is it that the United States, I mean, we saw the United States basically backing the overthrow of the Syrian government for years. Um, uh, we have seen the U.S. government go as far as uh, changing the flag of the country, um, not being successful in the war, and now just going full force with the economic war. Why is that the case? Is it that the United States want to cripple the Syrian people? Or why is this the case in your perspective? The United States is addressing terrorism and addressing corruption of an exploitation of a nation state by its leadership and by external forces that are using and exploiting that state in order to manipulate uh, its own people with no regard whatsoever for the consequences of what they are doing. Uh, this indeed, uh, I would surprisingly uh, quite agree with Sarah's conclusion that uh, there was an exact, I think she said, accurate and planned uh, rendition in the George Floyd case. However, we would profoundly differ diametrically in the, uh, in the causes of this. George Floyd did not die of being restrained while resisting repeatedly, resisting arrest, no, and not cooperating with law enforcement, no. He died of drugs in his system, which the police certainly did not put there, and he died of a heart condition 
pre-existing. Well, wow, His Frederick. Resistance wow, is we're what really, you know, we're, we're really getting on, analogy, Frederick. We're really getting the, on a it, whole yes, different subject yes. because we're we're talking about searing the analogy. Uh, but wow, I can say that um, that is an amazing. Uh, it's amazing what you've just said, being that I think everyone around the world have seen the video of the Thank knee you. on the neck. But another night, another definitely debate. We'll have to have I, you back um, for that. Sarah, getting back to the subject at hand. Um, yes. With the situation that is happening, uh, with the, the economic warfare that has been inflicted on Syria, my question is, where is the United Nations? How is it allowed for uh, as, a country, okay. for a country, yes. uh, this is for Sarah, how is it allowed for a country like the United States um, to basically do whatever it wants to do? We saw how it supported terrorism, actually, inside of that country. And now just sheer out economic warfare, not only on Damascus, but also um, actually threatening any country or any company that wants to do business with Syria? Well, this is an all-out effort by the U.S. to destroy even the ability of the United Nations and its humanitarian agencies to do the very job that they were created to do, which is to provide food and medicine in a time of urgent war crisis, national catastrophe, environmental catastrophe, and suddenly Syria will be denied any assistance whatsoever after the U.S. has bombed this country since 2014, armed hundreds of thousands of mercenary forces just to lay waste to Syria. That is the use of terrorism. And it is the United States government that is guilty of that terrorism, of arming and funding and training and also training through Israel and training through Saudi Arabia, terrorist forces in Syria. It's an all-out effort to bring down the government of Syria. Syria resisted. They called for assistance, which was legitimately provided. And that's very important to recognize that Syria has every legal right to resist this effort at a violent overturn and complete destruction by the U.S., and every country of the region has a right to economic exchange because it weakens every country in the region when there are borders and walls created artificially by the U.S. and enforced by Wall Street. Now, either countries stand up to it and begin to cooperate with each other, which is what the Syrian foreign minister called for. That's a very important call for resistance to an economic strangulation. And it is resonating increasingly with countries around the world who see that this um, shutdown by the U.S. is benefiting no one except Wall Street. And by the way, the people of the U.S. really pay for this. The, the death of two, more than 200,000 people in the U.S. from COVID-19 is because the U.S. policy of no cooperation, no social mobilization of the population. And, and so also are the deaths of more than 1,000 people in the U.S. by police shooting, by police murders. The social problems resonate back home and they resonate around the world. So, so opposing this policy is in everyone's interest. Frederick, how is it that the United States can unilaterally impose, uh, let's look at the Caesar Act. Um, what gives Washington the right to basically say that no other country or company have the right to deal with Syria um, in any way? Um, tell me the justification behind that especially if we look at international law. The justification is written right within it, and uh, Sarah once again continues her analogy. Let's, let's play with Sarah's analogy here. And we have the exploitation of the Syrian people by the government of Syria, by news quote-unquote commentators such as Sarah, to manipulate and turn truth inside out, upside down, and backwards. The demands that were made, the justifiable 
humanitarian demands that were made on the Syrian government were humanitarian in nature. These were for the abuses of that government against their own people to stop. Is this unreasonable? Take the knee off the neck, Sarah. Secondly, it was for refugees to be able to reacquire their own country and their own property. Sarah, take your knee off their neck and let them back. It was for prisoners who are grossly abused uh, and, and terror that is conducted by the government against their own people, a, and a, clap, a collapsing economy, except for the very top and the very rich, which are in league with international allies and preserved in power by the guns and cruelty of the knee-on-the-neck internationalists that are manipulating Syria, all the United States is saying is, let the people be free. Let them be free. Let them find their own prosperity and come, and they will have a, a very welcome, very prosperous, very capable partner in the United States and truly people around the world that seek true justice, not the manipulation of narratives in order to justify cruelty and justify pain inflicted by a dictatorship on their own people. Well, it's Sarah, interesting. You talked let's about true join prosperity, and Frederick. Take the knee Frederick, off the neck of the people in Frederick, Syria. You talked about true prosperity. Yes. Let the people find true prosperity. Yes. That can be quite difficult with crippling economic sanctions and making sure that there is very little trade um, that the country is able to deal in. What type of prosperity, what are you talking about? On the one hand, then the United States unilaterally, not uh, anything based on international law, by the way, unilaterally decides to take it in their own hands to do this and decide what's best for the Syrians. How can you justify this? And what do you mean as far as prosperity um, when the economic sanctions definitely are the, it's the antithesis to making sure that the Syrian people prosper? There is an opposition in Syria, which you are and Sarah is quite well aware of, that is seeking a voice of the people to be heard and to have the knee of the government taken off their neck. The United States is intervening on, the, on behalf of humanitarian interests and true justice and truth, not a manipulation of, of uh, movie scenes that can be trotted out to sustain, despicably sustain a government of oppression and a government of manipulation and cruelty. Read the... The, the, read the, the, the standards. There are five things that are asked for, and they are for the benefit of the, of the, uh, of the Syrian people, and they are for peace in the region. Okay. They so can easily be attained mm. by the government either waking up or the government changing, and the people rising up and enjoying their own reach for freedom with a willing, ready, and able partner in the United States and those who love freedom around the world. Wow, those who love freedom around the world. Sarah, I, I, I want to look at this, something that uh, yes. a few things that Frederick said here. Um, he says uh, there is an opposition um, there in Syria. Um, thus, the United States then has the right to get involved and do what they're doing. There's an opposition in the United States. There's opposition. Um, uh, there's definitely a schism inside of that country. I'm just wondering, um, let's reverse the roles a bit. Um, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, unrest inside of the United States right now, a lot of people who are not happy, a lot of people who would say that they're not free or they're not getting their, um, their rights in that country. I'm wondering what the United States would think about other countries actually imposing sanctions until the United States would abide by human rights. I'm sure there are lists that people in other countries could bring about and say. Um, but what would the reaction be if something like that would happen? 
Well, I want to first say that it, I think what was just right. expressed is a really good example of an absolutely racist, militarist, uh, blame the victim, blame the oppressed for war and destruction initiated by the U.S. U.S. wars around the world have led to the deaths of about 37 million people, complete disruption, destruction, millions of refugees, millions of refugees. Uh, really, the, 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 the toll of U.S. wars again and again, and we could look at <laughs> Vietnam to Korea, to the wars in Iraq and 19 years of war in Afghanistan, the complete destruction of Libya, to know that there's no freedom in U.S. wars. Now, that's important to recognize. And at the same time, the ridicule and the attacks on people of color in the U.S. who are resisting the all-out violence of the police in the U.S. who play the same role as the military does around the world and that is shoot first, complete destruction of neighborhoods, shutting down, no rights. And as I say, more than a thousand deaths a year, three a day in the U.S. by police killing people again and again. It's a national epidemic in the United States. So countries around the world are very seriously looking at how they can resist. It's not easy because the U.S. dollar is so predominant that the effort to shut down any business, any exchange, any trade uh, arrangement, even if humanitarian supplies, the U.S. government is shutting down. And that is what is so dangerous, so destructive. It really needs to be met in a more concerted way, yes, by countries and people standing up for the right of economic exchange, of the right of people to be free and to be sovereign, uh, not under the boot of U.S. Of bases, military bases around the world, more than 800 bases. There are sanctions on 39 countries. How do you get away from that? You can't deny it, and it has nothing, nothing to do with freedom or justice or sovereignty in any way whatsoever. So I, I think we really got to stop this myth and, and it, as I say, it is fundamentally a racist argument that is blaming the victims of, of U.S. wars and destruction here at home against indigenous people, against black people, Latinx, migrants who are put in cages, even children here in the U.S. We have to look at the highest rate of COVID deaths in the world to know that this is an empire that is destructive to people in the U.S. and around the world. And it has nothing to do with our interests or the interests of people around the world. It has okay. to do with what makes the most money, what makes the most profit. So standing up to it, the foreign minister gave a very important statement on how to stand up to it through cooperation. Many other voices at the U.N. echoed and made these same comments of the need for cooperation mm -hmm. going forward. And it was really uh, the U.S. who once again opposed it. Um, Frederick, um, a while ago, talked about the occupied Syrian territory, Golan Heights, oh, yes. and said that Damascus will never stop demanding its return and that there is nothing that Israel and the U.S. can do to change that reality. I want to talk about that side of things. It is Golan Heights, of course, belongs to Syria. Um, of course, now Israel is, is basically saying that, well, they have occupied it and said that it's theirs, or trying to say. Your take on that, I mean, according to the United Nations, there's one rule, one thing that it's saying, that, Syria, that Golan Heights belongs to Syria. And of course, Washington and Tel Aviv um, say something else. Why, why can't the United States abide by international law? The uh, Golan Heights are occupied by Syria out of necessity because missiles and terror are raining down upon Syria relentlessly from that position and it is Golan strategic is terrain. Occupied by they are Israel occupying it before. utterly in self-defense. And Sarah, once again, uh, should do some uh, stand-up comedy if the uh, 
the positions that she is representing weren't so reprehensible. Uh, Sarah, uh, once again, speaks with a knee on the neck of truth, manipulating fact and calling it a, a kiss and a neck massage, turning truth inside out and backwards, as we have discussed. It is simply not true. What, the, the same practices are being done by organizations going under names such as Black Lives Matter, which is a statement no one could disagree with, except when that statement is responded to by saying all lives matter, it is seen, that is seen as being racist. The okay, you did not answer. You, well, that was a great transition from Golan yeah, Heights, yeah, there, but, Frederick. I asked you the question specifically well, about the Golan Heights and about international I was law. Defending uh, the truth from Sarah's predations, but the let Golan me get Sarah Heights back in on this. Let me get Sarah. Sarah, was, your take on all of this. Uh, we, of we've course. heard what Frederick has had to say or not say about uh, everything you mentioned, and I want to end with this because. What Amwalem talked about was cooperating, cooperation between countries. He said, in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic, instead of countries working together, and even, for example, for Syria, sanctions, crippling sanctions have been implemented, Caesar Acts have been implemented um, to actually hurt them even on a humanitarian level. What is it going to take, in your perspective, Sarah, to be able to break this sanction regime that just be, has become so normal for the United States as a tool to use against any country that doesn't abide by whatever it says? Uh, I think what it's going to take is both cooperation and... Excuse me cooperation and continued resistance, steadfast resistance. Now, all of Palestine is occupied land, and Golan is occupied Syrian land. And it is the U.S. government that for years, in its military and diplomatic open-ended support of Israel, has created instability, as it's intended to, in the entire region. Now, Syria has never for a moment given up its claim for unity of all of Syria, including occupied Golan. And that isn't going to go away. It is, to me, I think what is important is the steadfast resistance that is shown in Syria, that is shown in Lebanon, that is shown by Iran, that is shown in Yemen, that is shown throughout the entire region and increasingly by the world. Okay. That kind of resistance to U.S. wars, domination, is is coming home more and more. And Thanks I so much. I'm so sorry, but we are out of time. I appreciate sure. both my no, no. guests being with me, Sarah Flanders, International Action Center out of New York, and Frederick Peterson, Senior Congressional Defense Advisor out of Washington, D.C. And always, as always, viewers, we appreciate you being with us on another debate. I'm Marzia Hashimi, signing out for myself and all the crew right here in Tehran. Hope to see you next time.